Renault's little catcher crossover model has matured nicely in this smarter second generation guise. It's now a little bigger, but as before, it's a Clio based design offering super economical engines, some genuinely clever interior touches, and no small dose of style. It'll appeal to super mini buyers wanting extra versatility as well as family hatchback customers in search of something more interesting and affordable. And it's the kind of car that'll certainly drive sales in this segment. If you're a volume brand these days, then you simply have to offer a B-segment super mini-based crossover SUV. And here's the one they all have to beat, Renault's Capture. In response to mounting competition, Renault's brought us the second generation version. It's a European class leader and we're going to test it. It seems a long time ago now that the Capture first arrived on the scene. It was launched in 2013 to replace the unloved Moda small MPV. Uh, the original version of this little crossover was the development of Starless Laurent van der Acker's Capture concept car of two years earlier. Now that motor show prototype had carbon fiber bodywork, huge 21 inch wheels and butterfly action doors. But of course, the production version was a lot less revolutionary. Although it was still a trendsetter in a small SUV segment that in those days had little to offer other than the rather divisive Nissan Duke. As we all know, the small crossover sector has exploded in size since, to Renault's considerable benefit. Over 1.5 million examples of the original capture were sold, with a far-reaching facelift along the way in 2017. Notably, in its final year production, it was even more popular than in the first, in that last 12 months outselling its Duke cousin in Europe by 5 to 1. Renault knew, though, that the party wouldn't last without a considerable design upgrade, which is what brought us this second-generation model in early 2020. Now, it shares its new CMFB platform with both the fifth-generation Renault Clio Super Mini and the Mark II model version of its cousin and close rival, the Nissan Duke. Now, that new chassis not only allows this capture to grow in size, but it also provides for the provision of electrification. A plug-in hybrid variant sits at the very top of the range, pioneering that technology in the segment. Most potential customers, however, will be selecting between more conventional variants, uh, all of which feature a much more sophisticated and higher quality cabin with stronger standards of safety and media connectivity. Families will value the fact that the useful sliding rear bench has been retained and that's still a relatively unusual feature in this class and the fact that the pricing remains competitive. It all sounds quite promising, doesn't it? But is it promising enough for this car to retain its European segment leadership? Time to put it to the test. The original capture hailed from an era where no one really expected a small SUV to handle with any real sense of driver engagement. But things have been changing in recent times. Uh, the Ford Puma has set a much higher bar in this regard for compact crossovers. One approached, although not quite emulated, by this French model's close cousin, the Nissan Duke. Now this Renault sells to a slightly different demographic to that one. Uh, the typical Capture customer isn't generally someone who ever feels uh, much of a need for a sporty drive, but we were still interested coming into this test to see whether any sort of dynamic step forward had really been made. That certainly ought to be the case. This second generation model, after all, sits on a much stiffer, more sophisticated CMFB platform and its revitalized engines offer a little more power too. But this is a more mature feeling thing than a Duke or a Puma and that's evident from your first half mile behind the wheel. Uh, that perception is mainly because refinement is much improved over the original capture. In fact, this is probably one of the quietest small SUVs that we've tested and that makes it one of the uh, few cars in the class that would have absolutely no qualms in taking on a really lengthy trip. 
So it's really comfort orientated then? Well, not quite. We had hope for that. Uh, the fluency of the old car's damping, the way it coped quite adroitly with both high speed undulations and low speed tarmac tears, was one of the things that we really liked about it goaded perhaps by its rivals into commissioning a slightly stiffer, sportier setup from its engineers, Renault has decided that the capture should lose some of that and the uh, bigger wheels that are now fitted obviously don't help much either, especially the optional 18 inch rims that are featured on this test car. It is still primarily a softly orientated setup and in our opinion it's a much better compromise for a likely buyer than the brittle one chosen for the Duke. Uh, but it can't quite rival the class leader in this regard, that's Volkswagen's T-Cross, uh, when you're cruising over poorer sections of our country's urban tarmac. On faster, twistier roads, there's still no particular pleasure to be had in slinging this runner around, but there is a purpose to the way that the car turns into the bends and a level of body control that certainly wasn't there before. Uh, it also helps that the steering is much better with a more natural weight and force buildup than any capture has delivered before. Uh, with a touch more bite and feel, it might be almost Puma-like and you'd have the real confidence when you're pushing on through wet and unsafe sighted corners that that Ford delivers. What about engines? Well, at first glance, the mainstream lineup of options beneath the bonnet might seem somewhat overly familiar for what's supposed to be a completely new generation design, as before built primarily around a small capacity three-cylinder petrol unit and a 1.5-litre four-cylinder diesel. But as with so much else about this second generation capture, you need to take a closer look. The base TCE 100 three-cylinder turbo petrol power plant, for example, is actually all new, a one-litre engine which replaces the previous 90 horsepower 0.9-litre uh, unit. As the moniker suggests, it puts out 100 horsepower and the extra 20 newton metres of pulling power now offered is welcome, uh, given the need to lug around nearly 1.2 tonnes of crossover. Even so, you'll need modest expectations when it comes to performance. Uh, stir the manual gear stick into action, still only get five speeds with the base petrol capture, and 62 from rest takes 13.3 seconds. That's a second and a half longer than it does on a Clio fitted with the same engine, and that shows the difference that an extra 56 kilos can make. Um, all of this on the way to a top speed that would just about hit 112 miles an hour if you really, really really wanted it to. Most of the other capture engines you can have are four-cylinder petrol units, one of which we've got here, another fresh power plant, the 1.3-litre TCE GPF engine that the Renault-Nissan Alliance uh, co-developed with Daimler and which, as a result, now pops up in everything from a swanky Mercedes CLA to a basic Dacia Duster. Here it puts out 130 horsepower, or at least it does in the TCE 130 variant that we're trying today. And this is mostly offered to UK customers, mated to a dual clutch, seven speed EDC auto gearbox. And this rather blunts this eager little engine's intentions, plus it's not especially eager to kick down, and it's a bit jerky in the way that it engages drive from rest. But if you can work around all that, and you're quick with these provided steering wheel paddle shifters, You'll find that uh, thanks to this unit's meaty 240 newton meter torque figure, uh, 62 from rest can be dispatched in uh, 9.6 seconds on the way to 120 miles an hour. With top spec trim, Renault also offers this TCE unit with a six speed manual box, and with that, the figures are 10.6 seconds and 121 mph. Stick with the auto, and your dealer will also offer you the option of the same engine in an uprated TCE 155 state of tune. Now, that improves the figures to 8.6 seconds and 126 miles an hour. Okay, so that's the mainstream petrol options covered, but what if you want something rather more frugal? Well, unlike most of its rivals, Renault hasn't completely abandoned diesel power for this segment, uh, providing as ever the kind of 1.5 litre black pump fueled option uh, that it seems to have been offering in its compact models uh, since the dawn of time, really. Uh, the French maker insists that this current era blue DCI unit is a very different thing to earlier versions of the same power plant, and that's thanks to a selective catalytic reduction system which enables it to meet the strictest pollution control standards.
That is an argument that we might find convincing were it not for the huge jump in asking price necessary to go from the TCE 100 petrol variant to the blue DCI 95 diesel. As it is, finding £2,000 more to get a capture that fuels from the black pump is a premium that's unlikely to be justified by the cost savings possible over a typical compact crossover buyer's annual mileage. Now that's disappointing because this DCI unit's muscular 240 newton meter torque figure means it pulls like a train through the six-speed manual gearbox with an eagerness that's not reflected by the cold performance stats. Rest to 62 and 14.4 seconds en route to 110 mph. If you want to improve those stats in a diesel capture or possibly you want to tow a light trailer, then a runner will offer you the same engine and a 115 HP state of tune in which form there's 260 newton meters of pulling power and 62 from rest takes 11 seconds with the DCI 115 manual or 11.9 with the optional EDC auto. And with either transmission, you'll reach a maximum of 116 miles an hour in the unlikely event that you ever want to drive your diesel capture absolutely flat out. We're not quite finished on engines because we haven't yet briefed you on Renault's efforts towards electrification. Uh, if you'd hoped that these might include an affordable petrol hybrid engine, uh, such as the one that you'll find in the Clio lineup, well, you'll be disappointed there. Uh, the brand has decided that the capture should have the more advanced but far pricier plug-in hybrid setup that features in the Megane. Uh, there's no full electric BEV option either. Renault thinks that that market is covered off by its Zoe model. The capture plug-in hybrid model uses an E-Tech powertrain for which Renault engineers have registered more than 150 patents. Uh, it's a 1.6 litre petrol engine mated to two electric motors and a multi-mode clutchless transmission that the brand believes will offer excellent efficiency and barely noticeable gear changes. Now, the system puts out uh, 160 horsepower, around 20 HP more than the equivalent plug-in package that Kia offers in its rival Nero PHEV. And it features a 9.8 kilowatt hour battery, uh, 400 volts that is, which allows a range of about 30 miles, plus the ability to travel at up to 84 miles an hour on electric power alone. After a stop, the transmission uses electric power to restart the car silently and with immediate acceleration. When you're passing a vehicle or merging onto the highway, it combines the combustion and electric powered engines to increase the available power and to offer better acceleration. The Capture E-Tech plug-in also features specific multi-sense drive settings. There are three, Pure, which is activated by a special button on the dashboard. That's the full electric setting and that's selectable provided there's enough power. Uh, the second one, uh, MySense, optimizes the hybrid mode for lower running costs. And there's also an e-save feature that'll hold up to 40% of the battery power for later in the journey. Uh, let's say for the urban driving that you might have to do at the end of a lengthy trip. Now finally, sport mode allows the driver of a Capture E-Tech to take advantage of maximum performance by combining the power of the engine and of the two electric motors. Now in this setting, rest to 62 takes 10.1 seconds en route to 108 miles an hour. Whichever engine you select in this capture, the excellent refinement that we alluded to earlier means that you'll not be much orally troubled by what lies beneath the bonnet. Uh, noise suppression is aided in this second generation model by a windscreen that's been treated with a sound insulation film, uh, extra engine compartment soundproofing and a double ceiling system for the doors. As a result, Renault says that this Mark II model is two decibels quieter than its predecessor at cruising speeds. Highway motoring will be made even easier if you've gone for a top spec automatic TCE 130 or TCE 155 petrol model and you've paid extra for the traffic and motorway assistance pack. Now that delivers a certain amount of the level two autonomous driving tech that was uh, previously limited to larger cars. Here a combination of lane keep assist and adaptive cruise control can temporarily take over the driving duties and that's provided you keep your hands on the wheel uh, starting and stopping the car when tailbacks occur. But we think this technology really works best in town where it can take over when you're just inching along in one of those really annoying crawling traffic queues. 
Even without sophistication like that, this capture should prove to be a pretty agreeable travelling companion. Uh, features like a 360 degree camera system and a hands-free parking setup can be optioned in. And talking of technology, at the top of the range with the conventional engines, uh, it's also possible to specify a simpler version of the multi-sense driving mode system that we referenced earlier. Now, when this is paired with an ordinary TCE or DCI engine, it's not exactly over endowed with settings, uh, basically just green tinged eco and red tinged sport, plus a purple themed My Sense screen, which can act as a one touch option, incorporating your preferred steering, instrument panel, and cabin lighting selections. Uh, it is yet another big car feature from a small crossover with big ideas. Big enough, though, to make you want one? Quite possibly. Renault likes to think of itself as being a successfully innovative manufacturer, which in some respects isn't actually quite true. Modern history records that when this Gallic maker has tried to do something genuinely innovative, uh, the result has usually fallen flat. Think Avon Time, Valsartis, Clio V6 and so on. Now, where Renault really does tend to strike gold, though, is by taking existing vehicle genres and then refining them and adding style and substance. And the company's Renault Spore hot hatches are one example of that. And its turn-of-the-century scenic MPV models are another. In both cases, the French brand borrowed from another company's pioneering ideas, but then packaged the products so well that they became absolute bywords for excellence in their segments. Now that's happened again with the Capture. It's now the defining small SUV and the segment's European market leader. This second generation model's predecessor offered a template for the way a crossover of this kind should look. Uh, this is one of the first cars in the sector, for example, to feature the styling device that designers call a floating roof. Uh, this has been retained here, of course, as part of a car that has now become significantly bigger, 110 millimeters longer, 19 mils wider, and 17 millimeters taller than before. If you want some class perspective, well, think fractionally bigger than a Ford Puma and a bit smaller than a Peugeot 2008, and you'll be about there. From this profile perspective, you take in these deeply scalloped sides, the high waistline, uh, the curious silver and black styling device on the front wings, and the black plastic clad arches, which house wheels varying between 17 and 18 inches in size. We have the 18 inch Pasadena style rims here. Uh, the roof is much more swept back than it was on the original capture, and it can, to suit the class fashion, be specified in contrasting colors, uh, gray, white, orange, or as in this case, diamond black. Arguably, even more has changed from a frontal perspective. Full LED headlights uh, are standard and look particularly striking when, on a top model like this one, they're surrounded by Renault's trademark C-shaped daytime running light signature. Uh, these beams are seamlessly integrated into the design with chrome elements that appear to flow into this wider front grille with its prominent Renault emblem there. Um, the bumper incorporates two wide corner air deflectors which add to the assertive character and they apparently also improve aerodynamics. And to emphasize the crossover genre, there's the usual low uh, silver skid plate which, like the side sills, can be color coordinated in orange or grey on request. At the rear, the flush fitting hatch has slim LED tail lights intended to emphasize body width with C-shaped illuminating 3D signatures. Further detailed touches include a shark fin roof antenna and a rear reversing camera that's built into the central brand emblem. Uh, plus, here again, there's that uh, color personalizable lower skid plate. As usual, what's more important though is the stuff that you can't see, and that's uh, this second generation captures all new CMS FB or common module family B segment platform, which is not only a stiffer structure, but has also allowed for the electrified engineering, which is now found at the top of the range. Now this chassis is 50 kilos lighter than that of the previous model and more weight has been saved uh, through use of an aluminium bonnet and through the fashioning of this uh, tailgate from composite plastic. 
Good enough. So we have an evolution in styling and a revolution in structural engineering. Which of these approaches is going to dominate inside? Time to take a look up front. Well, it's certainly a big step forward from what was offered before. That slight whiff of second-class citizenship that was delivered by the cabin of the previous capture has been well and truly banished here in favour of soft-touch trimming, tactile touch points and a distinctly Audi-esque feel to parts of this completely revitalised design, particularly the uh, circular ventilation dials that sit midway down the centre stack. Smart piano key switches sit just above, plus various satin finished silver embellishments and the redesigned more enveloping seats both also play their part in helping to push this car a little more upmarket. Uh, the cabin does still lack the sheer solidity of a Volkswagen Group product in this segment, but if you jump out of a Ford Puma or perhaps something Korean into one of these, and you might feel like you've been upgraded to business class. The horizontally orientated dash lends a bit of extra visual width to the whole design, and it's now divided into three parts, with squidgy plastic along the top section, a coated and customizable centre panel, and a lower area housing functional components uh, like the glove box. This big 9.3-inch Tesla-like portrait-style central screen for the EasyLink infotainment system helps, of course, with the whole more sophisticated demeanour. Or at least it will if it's been fitted. Uh, the mid-range iconic variants that most capture customers choose come with a less eye-catching, smaller 7-inch landscape version of this display. Try to find a version with this iPad-like 9.3-inch screen because it just adds the finishing touch to what Renault's tried to do here. It feels satisfyingly sophisticated as you poke and pinch and swipe your way through the menus for things like uh, navigation, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, apps, uh, multimedia options and the DAB audio system which will offer superb sound quality when you order it with the optional premium 9-speaker Bose version which has been designed specifically for this car. Now plush models also allow you to use this monitor to set various ambient lighting profiles. Uh, you can choose from white, blue, green, purple, red, sky blue, yellow and orange shades and they change the colour of the classy LED strips that feature around the gear lever and in the door pulls. The instrument binnacle can also be quite colourful, uh, stretched beyond the bass play and the mid-range iconic trim levels and you'll find the usual gauges here replaced by this 7-inch colour screen. Uh, it's designed to change in colour and design layout on models fitted with multi-sense drive system settings but a bit annoyingly uh, none of the modes allow you to see a speedo dial and a rev counter at the same time. Uh, integrated selectable display options controlled by buttons on this redesigned three-spoke steering wheel sit both to the top left and the top right of the main virtual dial. Now the left one shows uh, horsepower and newton meter readouts and eco meter, trip computer data and current MPG while that on the right can display navigational directions, a compass or your audio selection. Now if you'd like this TFT display to cover the full width of the binnacle as it would in a larger more expensive modern SUV than an even larger 10-inch instrument binnacle screen. That's the largest in the segment can be fitted at the very top of the range on request. What else? Uh, well, on selected models, optional interior colour packs can brighten things a little by adding orange, blue or red trimming to the fascia, the door cards, the seat edging and the gear shifts around. Uh, cabin design ergonomics are generally pretty good, although you do get occasional screen reflections. Uh, there's not much room between the centre console and the clutch pedal, and we would prefer to have seen a proper knob for audio volume rather than these two fiddly screen buttons. Now, fortunately, there are more easily accessible volume controls on the steering column too. Uh, to the left of that column uh, sits the starter button, which once again remains slightly hidden. 
Now, the brand hasn't followed its PSA group rivals by adding in an optional head-up display, but everything that you really need falls to hand easily enough, uh, particularly the EasyLink infotainment screen here. Now, it's canted very slightly towards the driver for ease of reach, and it offers limited voice activation for things like uh, simple addresses, uh, phone numbers, and track selection. As for practicalities, well, our testers had mixed feelings here. Uh, as with so many French cars, the glove box is halved in size by an awkwardly shaped fuse box. Now, PSA Group cars suffer from this failing too. It really is about time that Gallic brands sorted that issue out. Uh, still, at least the glove box is properly illuminated and has an inner lid compartment. Uh, you get a useful bank of connectivity ports and a deep well in front of the gear stick here, a 12 volt, an aux in, and twin USBs. Plus, there's space for a wireless charging mat, but it can't all be shut away with a cover, so you'll have to leave your smartphone powering up in front of prying eyes. Uh, Renault has forgotten to fit an overhead sunglasses compartment, and the brand also seems to have forgotten its MPV heritage because there's no provision for anything like um, under seat or passenger footwell storage. But on the plus side, uh, the door pockets here are of a reasonable size and you get uh, ticket clips in the sun visors. Plus, between the seats, uh, there are twin cup holders and a shallow receptacle sits near this electronic handbrake switch. Uh, you do get a conventional handbrake on the humbler variants. Uh, behind that, there is a small lidded box which also acts as an armrest. Earlier, we referenced the fact that this Mark II capture was a little taller than its predecessor, but that hasn't translated into extra interior headspace. In fact, if you specify this optional sunroof, you'll find that the ceiling is about 40 millimeters lower than it would be in an equivalent Clio Super Mini, which isn't what you expect from a supposedly high-riding SUV. Uh, at least you can find a comfortable driving position, and that's thanks to plenty of steering column adjustability, uh, plus there's also a wide range of seat height options. Although, uh, a little disappointingly, these front chairs here can't be had with any kind of adjustable lumbar support, even as an option. As for all-round visibility, well, as with quite a few other cars in this class, there might be a few issues when it comes to looking over your shoulder. The freshly swept back roofline means that rear three-quarter vision can be occasionally problematic when you're reversing. Now, that won't be good news to buyers of the base play trim level because that is the only one in the range which has to do without rear parking sensors. Um, you have to stretch right to the top of the lineup to get a standard reversing camera and a 360 degree bird's eye view camera can be further added at the top of the range. Uh, frontward visibility on old captures isn't too bad. Uh, it's helped by these thin front A pillars, a decent set of door mirrors and by a reasonably high set driving position which is a lot more commanding than the one that you get on a rival VW Group small SUV model. What else? Uh, well, we talked earlier about the quality improvement here, although Renault still has work to do in this regard, as you discover when you inspect the fittings in more detail. Uh, some of it holds up to scrutiny, things like the Volvo-like uh, textile upholstery fabric and those Audi-style digital climate dials we referenced earlier. Some of it, though, is less impressive, like the way that the gear selector creaks in its casing and the lower part of the fascia flexes ahead of your right knee. Uh, this silvered satin finish, plastic finishing, looks like it might uh, struggle to stand the test of time too. Uh, some of this stuff is to be expected. This is a super mini derived SUV after all. But if Renault wants to start producing versions of this costing over £25,000, as is happening now with the introduction of hybrid tech, then buyer perceptions of this cabin might start to be less forgiving. OK, let's take a seat in the back. Now, the reason why so many Renault customers chose the original Capture over an equivalent Clio uh, was that there was so much more space in the back. In fact, the earlier version of this SUV was usually seen as one of the segment's larger compact SUVs, but other rivals have since caught up. And although, as we referenced earlier, this second-generation model is a bigger design, only a small part of that increase in size, just 20 million millimeters has translated into extra wheelbase length. Still, access is easy. It's certainly better than it is in a lower roof-lined rival like the Peugeot 2008 and the Ford Puma. 
It actually feels very decently spacious back here by class standards. Uh, rear legroom's been improved by 17 millimeters, and that's thanks in part to redesigned front seats uh, that also feature these curiously angled, comma-shaped headrests. They are apparently designed to improve frontward visibility for rear seat occupants. The original capture was the first car in the class to offer a sliding rear bench, a feature copied since in the small SUV segment only by the Volkswagen T-Cross. And it's still one of the things that we think family folk will like most about this Renault. Now, larger SUVs that offer that feature split the seat base so that uh, folk on different sides of the cabin can adopt different legroom preferences. Here, though, the whole thing slides in one movement over a range of 160 millimetres. And I'm not going to get too excited about the amount of leg space that you get with it pushed right back. Uh, 680 millimetres, a humble Volkswagen Polo Super Mini offers 690 mils of room to stretch out without any kind of seat antics at all. Uh, that VW also offers 30 mils more headspace than you get back here. Still, by small SUV standards, this remains a reasonably spacious area. It's much less claustrophobic than a Duke, a Puma or a Toyota CHR. And that's thanks in part to the addition of these tiny rear quarter windows. And of course, it's way more roomy than an equivalent Clio. You're reasonably well provided for back here too. There are individual overhead reading lights. Uh, that's unusual amongst cars in this class. And the silly elasticated Art Deco seatback straps of the earlier model are replaced here by uh, proper seatback pockets. Uh, the seatbacks don't recline, but part of the upholstery can be zippered back for easier cleaning removal. Uh, thanks to this low central transmission tunnel, three adults could be accommodated at a push if need be. And Kids will be delighted to find that a couple of USB ports and a 12 volt socket are provided beneath these twin centre vents. Uh, the door card finish is somewhat doer, but there are decently sized storage bins, door pull cubbies, and an overhead coat hook too. Plus, Isofix child seat fastenings feature on the outer two seats. We'll finish with a look at cargo space. Now this has increased by a useful 81 litres to as much as 536 litres this time around, although that's with the rear bench slid all the way forward, crushing adult knees against the front seat backs. This useful lower pull lever allows you to yank it back and with the bench pulled right back towards you, the boot space falls to um, 422 litres in size. It's still pretty reasonable by class standards, but it's hardly class leading. Uh, it's 12 litres less than you'll get in a Peugeot 2008 and 34 litres less than is offered by a Ford Puma. Still, neither of those two cars have a sliding bench to improve things. And even with the seat back like this, there's more room than you get in a pricier golf class family hatch. Uh, six carry-on cases will fit here which sounds quite good until you reference the fact that a rival Skoda Kamiq will take seven cases and a Ford Puma eight. Unlike in a Clio, you get an adjustable height boot floor, so this is at least a really flexible space. Uh, set the uh, luggage board at its lowest position and there's room for really quite tall items. There will be more capacity beneath the uh, felt-like floor carpet of the cargo base, although only if you're unwise enough not to pay extra for this optional space saver spare wheel. Uh, talking of space beneath the cargo floor, on most small SUVs, if you specify an audio upgrade, you'll find that taken up by a subwoofer for the sound system, but not on this capture. Renault worked with specialists Bose to create a new externally ducted subwoofer called a fresh air speaker, which, where it's fitted, is incorporated into the left-hand cargo sidewall of the boot and allows this car to retain its complete cargo capacity. What else? Uh, well, there are two bag hooks and a left-hand boot light, but there's no 12-volt socket. There are, however, four tie-down points. Uh, one day we will come across a small SUV fitted with a properly flexible 40-20-40 split backrest, but that day hasn't come yet, so this capture gets the usual 60-40 split affair, which, when it's pushed forward, frees up 1,275 litres of capacity across an almost flat load floor of 1.57 metres. That's 110 mils more than the previous model could offer. If you do need more luggage space, then your dealer will walk you over to the other side of the showroom and suggest instead you take a look at the brand's Megane-based mid-sized SUV, the Kajar crossover model.
Not many small SUVs are sold these days for less than £20,000, which goes largely unnoticed by most customers because, like many cars these days, models in this category are more often bought on finance rather than being purchased outright. From the launch of this second-generation Capture, it was theoretically possible to buy a version of this Renault from just over £18,000. But that figure, of course, applies only to a version with the feeblest engine and the most Spartan level of trim, and that's a combination that few will want. So most potential customers for this Renault uh, will be looking at variants which sit in the twenty to £25,000 bracket common in the class. Uh, you'll need a £30,000 budget, though, if you want the top E-Tech plug-in hybrid version. That 1.6 litre petrol hybrid is available only at the very top of the range, but most of the other engine options can be had with most of the main trim levels. Uh, spec choices start with base play, and that's expected to take 20% of sales, and then extend up through mid-range iconic trim, the big seller with 43% of sales, and onto this plush S edition model, which Renault says will take the remaining 37% of orders. Petrol people get to choose between an entry-level three-cylinder, one-litre TCE 100 unit mated to a manual gearbox, or, as in this case, a four-cylinder, 1.3-litre TCE power plant shared with Mercedes, which is available in either TCE 130 guys, and that's the one we have here, or in a perkier TCE 155 state of tune. Now, normally, this four-cylinder unit will be paired with the seven-speed EDC dual-clutch auto transmission that we've been trying today, but if you're interested in the TCE 130 unit with the well-specified S edition level of trim uh, that we've got in this case, then Renner will offer it to you at a slight saving with a six-speed manual gearbox. Now, unlike its alliance partner Nissan, Renault still thinks there's a market for diesel in this segment. So, also offers its familiar 1.5-litre four-cylinder blue DCI diesel, either in 95 HP form, mated to manual transmission, or in 115 HP form with manual or EDC auto transmission. In our market, though, don't expect to come across too many captures so equipped. You'll be wanting to know how this car's pricing compares to obvious rivals in this segment. Uh, back in 2013, at its original introduction, the Capture had just a single segment competitor, its close cousin, the Nissan Duke. At the time of the launch of this second generation version in 2019, though, that number had grown to well over 20 B-segment SUV rivals. So, how does it stack up against them? Well pretty well as it turns out, and that helps to explain why our market accounts for such a high proportion of Renault's global capture sales. With entry-level trim and the base TCE 100 petrol engine, uh, this car costs a few hundred pounds more than the latest version of that Nissan Duke, and that uses a slightly more powerful 117 PS version of the same engine. But you might accept that, uh, given that this Renault has more flexible rear seat accommodation and a much bigger bigger boot. Look elsewhere in the sector and you'll find that the Capture is very comfortably priced against the VW Group entrance in this segment, uh, the Volkswagen T-Cross, the Skoda Kamiq and the Seat Arona. And this Renault undercuts the PSA Group contenders in this class by quite a bit, being around £1,000 less than a Citroen C3 Aircross and around £2,000 less than a Vauxhall Crossland X or a Peugeot 2008. Now, if you're looking at this four-cylinder TCE 130 Capture petrol model, then you'll be the kind of customer who might also have their eye on class favourites like the Ford Puma, which costs only a few hundred pounds more, and the Toyota CHR, which, uh, because of its full hybrid power plant, costs a lot more, with prices starting at around, uh, well, over £26,000, in fact. Of course, we haven't yet given you an exhaustive list of all the other cars in the growing small SUV B segment. Uh, the two Korean class entries, Kia's Stonic and Hyundai's Kona, they're quite comparably priced against the Capture, but as with the Duke, they won't offer you as much space for luggage or for rear seat folk. Uh, models like the Mazda CX-30, the Jeep Renegade, the Audi Q2, the Honda HR-V, um, even Suzuki's Vitara and S-Cross models, they're quite a lot pricier. Ford's Echo Sport, uh, Fiat's 500X, the DS3 Crossback and the Mitsubishi ASX are clunkier to drive and they're pricier to run too. 
and the MG ZS, the Sangyong Tivoli and the Dacia Duster, although they're cheaper than this Renault to buy, uh, they feel a lot cheaper inside, they're less personalisable and again, they're not as good as this capture is to drive. Having considered all that, we can understand why you might be quite set on this Renault. And if so, then the deal might be sealed if the brand were able to be generous in terms of standard specification. Is that the case? Well, let's see. Now, you wouldn't expect to get any of the real niceties with base play trim, and you don't. But even at that level, there's full LED headlights, 17-inch Nymphaea Flex alloy wheels, uh, power folding, heated mirrors, tinted rear windows, and a Thatcher immobiliser, along with RAID, Renault Anti-Intruder Device Automatic Locking. Plus, there's a very complete roster of camera-driven safety kit, which we'll get to shortly. Uh, inside a Capture Play variant, there's automatic air conditioning, there's cruise control with a speed limiter, driver's seat height adjustment, and you get keyless key card entry too. Uh, infotainment, that's taken care of by a centrally mounted landscape format 7-inch display, which uses Renault's latest EasyLink multimedia system. Now that groups useful functions, apps and services together and gives you Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, smartphone mirroring, uh, a DA AB tuner and Bluetooth audio streaming. Uh, always on 4G connectivity, supports automatic updates from Google, from TomTom Tom and Coyote, and that ensures that this media platform is always up to date. Most buyers of this Renault, though, as we suggested earlier, will want to stretch at least to mid-level iconic trim, and that's what you'll have to have uh, to get yourself the two-tone paint finish that many buyers will want. Uh, iconic trim also gets you that EasyLink touchscreen fitted out with navigation. That's a 3D setup, which includes real-time information from TomTom Tom about heavy traffic or potential danger ahead, as well as extra functions like the ability to search for addresses using the Google Play system. Uh, other iconic spec features, while well, they include longitudinal roof bars, extra tinting for the rear windows and the tailgate, rear parking sensors and a smarter Bahamas style design for the 17 inch alloy wheels. Need more? Well, then your next stop is this S Edition trim, and that's recognisable by its signature LED C-shaped front lighting, uh, the shark fin roof antenna, and the classier diamond cut finish with grey inserts for the 17-inch Bahamas alloy wheels. Uh, S Edition builds on iconic spec with auto high beam headlamps, reversing camera, and front parking sensors. Inside, in an S Edition model, there's upholstery that's part trimmed in synthetic leather, plus you get leather for the steering wheel, and an auto dimming rear view mirror, an electronic parking brake with an auto hold function, uh, also a wireless phone charger and Renault's multi-sense package which offers three driving modes and eight ambient lighting settings. Plus you also get a greater dose of Renault's screen technology here, a large and 9.3 inch portrait touchscreen version of that EasyLink central display and a 7 inch TFT screen from the instrument cluster. On to options now, let's start with personalization because most buyers probably will. Uh, bear in mind that you'll almost certainly be paying your dealer extra for your choice of paint shade uh, since the only standard color and the only solid one is Boston Blue. Beyond that, there are a range of metallic colors, or you could go for a pricier Renault ID metallic shade, like this test car's flame red finish. Uh, the contrast roof color, that will be important to capture buyers too. It's optional with base play trim, and as we've said, it's standard elsewhere in the range. Uh, now, there are four contrast roof color shades, Highland Gray, uh, Alabaster White, Desert Orange, or as in this case, Diamond Black. Uh, now, to avoid you creating something too garish, Renault has restricted the availability of some of these to particular main body colors. If you've avoided entry-level trim, there are two other personalization options, two exterior packs and three interior color packs. The exterior packs come in either orange or gray and add in the requisite color to the door sills and the front and rear skid plates. The interior color packs add color to the center of the fascia, uh, to the door cards, the seat edging and the gear shifts around. And they come either in two fairly restrained shades of blue and red or with an extrovert orange 
signature finish. Uh, beyond these packs, you might also want to add satin grey door mirror shells, uh, illuminated door sill strips, sports pedals, an underbody welcome light, and maybe even if you have completely misunderstood this captures fashion remit, off-road styling bars too. And beyond personalization and aesthetics, what else can you pay extra for? Well, with base play trim, uh, you'll probably want to add in the longitudinal roof bars. With iconic trim, you can specify a parking pack that gives you front parking sensors and a rear view camera. And on an iconic spec capture, you can upgrade yourself to the diamond cut finished, gray trimmed, 17 uh, inch Bahamas alloy wheels. Uh, other possible extras include a uh, Kenwood dash cam, uh, an inductive smartphone charger and an alarm. The real luxury options though are reserved for S edition customers. Now Renault is keen that capture buyers at this end of the range should consider the bespoke nine speaker premium audio setup that it's developed for this car in partnership with specialist Bose. Now this features immersive sound quality with two extra tweeters in the rear door panels and a very compact subwoofer. Now the French maker is calling this a fresh air speaker. Uh, it's been fitted to a Renault for the very first time and it offers superior bass frequencies without the need for a conventional large enclosure that would take up boot space. Now instead, uh, sound is channeled to the passenger compartment uh, through a patented duct system, which is built into the vehicle structure. Now those on board uh, can tailor the Bose audio experience to their personal tastes, uh, switching from a neutral studio-like setting to a warmer and more immersive quality of sound. Plus there's dynamic speed compensation too. Now this automatically adjusts the volume and the sound equalization on the move so you don't have to continually adjust the volume as the speed rises. Now this Bose premium system is available for an extra £350 and it's an option well worth having if you like your music. Other S edition options include a parking pack premium package which gives you a 360 degree surround view camera and a hands-free parking setup that steers the car into spaces. Uh, there's also a luxury pack that gives you black leather upholstery, uh, heated front seats and a heated steering wheel. Uh, at this end of the range too you get the option of paying extra for the optional 10-inch smart cockpit instrument pack. That's a digital instrument binnacle screen that offers even more uh, opportunity for the driver to customize the display in front of them. It offers a range of different themes and settings. Now, if you've gone for an S edition model with EDC automatic transmission, uh, then you can additionally specify a comfort pack. Now, that will give you uh, what Renault calls a flying center console with an e-shifter for the gears, plus a height adjustable front passenger seat and also an opening sunroof in lieu of roof bars. Uh, the S edition model can also be optionally fitted with these striking 18 inch Pasadena diamond cut alloy wheels with grey inserts. On to practicalities, uh, you're going to want to pay extra for a spare wheel and it can only be of the reduced size space saver variety. You can also specify mud flaps, a tow bar, rubber floor mats, an all-in-one boot liner and quick fix roof bars that fit with the longitudinal bars and which will allow you to add an optional 380 litre roof box. Uh, on to safety features. Now it almost goes without saying that this car, like others in the segment, achieved a five star rating in Euro NCAP tests, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Euro NCAP rewarded this model excellent overall scores, 96% for adult protection and 83% for child protection, while pedestrian safety achieved a 74% showing. That's enough to offer plenty of peace of mind if we'll be using this car for family transport. Part of the reason why this second generation capture managed to achieve those results lies with its impressive levels of camera safety provision. As you expect from a new model in this day and age, uh, autonomous braking is included right across the range and that's a standard. Uh, this AEBS active emergency braking system is bolstered by the latest cyclist and pedestrian detection functionality. Uh, all captures also get lane departure warning and lane keep assist, 
which work together on the highway to alert you if you're drifting out of your lane and if you don't respond to the warnings will apply subtle steering assistance to ease the car back to where it ought to be. Uh, there is also traffic sign recognition. Now that will picture the speed signs that you pass and then display them on a dash. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this top S edition trim level, this also gets a headlight auto high beam function too. Otherwise, uh, safety provision is limited to pretty standard stuff. All models get twin front side and curtain airbags, although no driver's knee bag, plus the usual electronic aids for braking, traction and stability control. And that includes emergency brake assist for emergency stops. Uh, ice fix charge seat fastenings, tyre pressure monitoring and hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. They are all additional features that make the team sheet. Uh, plus there's a distance warning alert feature. Now that will warn you if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front. And uh, we have an e-call automated emergency call feature. Now that will alert the emergency services to your exact GPS location if the airbags go off in an accident. At the top of the capture range, Renault is also offering a limited degree of level two autonomous driving capability with this car, or at least more than you could get on most other small SUVs at the time of this second generation capture's launch. Uh, buyers of automatic versions of this S edition variant can specify an optional traffic and motorway assistance pack. Now this embellishes the lane keep assist feature that we just mentioned with adaptive cruise control. Now, those two systems can then combine together at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour to control the speed of the car and maintain safe distances with the vehicles ahead, uh, whilst still keeping this Renault perfectly centred in its lane. Now, if you hit a tailback, uh, the system will seamlessly bring you to a halt and then it will automatically start you off again when things start moving. Today, buyers in the segment for small SUVs want technology, and technology features inevitably deliver extra weight. Uh, that means that an automotive engineer developing a compact crossover these days faces a constant battle against bulk, uh, and that's tackled across the industry with varying degrees of success. It really helps if you have a decently sophisticated platform to work with, and that's something that the Renault Capture lacked in its original form. Hence the importance of this Mark II model's new CMFB common module family B segment chassis structure, which features high elastic limit steel, which not only stiffens the underpinnings, but it also makes them significantly lighter. All of which is the main reason why Renault has been able to load up this model with a plusher cabin and big car features, yet still keep the curb weight within reasonable bounds. Uh, the entry level version tips the scales at 1,190 kg. That's not much more than a Super Mini. So what does all that translate out to in terms of WLTP rated fuel and CO2 emissions readings? Well, let's see, uh, starting with the base TCE 100 petrol version, uh, this variant's three-cylinder power plant claims to be state-of-the-art, although it still soldiers on with a manual gearbox, which features only five speeds, and it offers various engineering aspects that Renault calls innovations, although they're hardly unique to the small car segment. Uh, things like a turbocharger with an electronically controlled discharge valve, uh, an exhaust manifold that's partially integrated into the cylinder head, uh, hydraulic twin variable intake timing and a bore spray coating for reduced friction. Uh, the result of all this is an efficiency reading that sees a possible CO2 return of up to 136 grams per kilometre. Up to 47.1 mpg is quoted for the combined cycle fuel return. That sounds good until you reference the fact that a Renault Clio TCE 100 Super Mini with exactly the same engine manages 54.3 mpg. So there is still a pretty significant penalty then for the extra weight and bulk of the SUV body style in a small car. These readings are virtually the same as the returns you get from a base entry level petrol version of this car's cousin, the Nissan Duke, uh, as you'd expect they would be really, since the uh, car shares exactly the same engine. And they're also very similar to the readings that are quoted for rival 
one litre TSI petrol versions of the Volkswagen Group's offerings in the sector, uh, the VW T-Cross, the say, Arona and the Skoda Kamiq. But there are more frugal and cleaner class options. Uh, now, thanks to its mild hybrid tech, Ford's Puma is slightly more efficient, uh, as are the PSA Group, uh, Peugeot, Citroën, Vauxhall and DS models in the segment. Although in those cases, that is mainly because those cars are slightly lighter than this Renault. Here we've got the four-cylinder TCE 130 1.3 litre petrol unit, uh, which with the most affordable trim levels has to be had with the EDC auto transmission that we're trying today. In that form, it manages up to 44.8 miles per gallon and up to 141 grams per kilometre. Those official figures do seem reasonably realistic in day-to-day -day use. I mean, during our test, we've been getting over 40 mpg regularly. And that should translate into an achievable driving range of around 420 miles from the 45-litre fuel tank. This four-cylinder TCE engine, co-developed with Daimler, is fitted with a GPF petrol particulate filter which destroys particles in the exhaust gases by trapping them in a microporous honeycomb structure which regenerates automatically at regular intervals. Uh, if you get this power plant with manual transmission, it's fractionally less efficient, up to 44.1 mpg and 144 grams per kilometre. The same engine can also be had in an uprated TCE 155 state of tune. It's mated there to EDC auto transmission and it manages up to 44.8 mpg and up to 146 grams per kilometre of CO2. Now, if none of these powertrains are efficient enough for you, then your Renault dealer has two more options. Uh, the first is an engine that the Renault-Nissan Alliance Group uh, still relies heavily on, a 1.5-litre blue DCI diesel. It's available either in manual form with 95 horsepower or in manual and automatic guise with 115 HP. And either way, it manages up to 58.9 mpg and up to 124 grams per kilometre. Compare that to an equivalent Clio DCI 85 models, 67.2 mpg and 109 grams per kilometre. Uh, to give you some SUV class perspective on that, a comparable rival Peugeot 2008 1.5 litre blue HDI 100 model would manage up to 62.7 mpg and 118 grams per kilometre. So this Renault unit is no longer class leadingly frugal, but it's still right up there. Uh, the blue DCI badging references the fact that this captures black pump fueled unit now features a selective catalytic reduction system to deal with nitrogen oxide NOx emissions. Uh, be that as it may, a diesel though doesn't really fit with the current Enviro trends, so it was inevitable for this second generation Renault capture that they would introduce an engine featuring some form of trend electrification. Opinions differ widely amongst manufacturers in the segment for small SUVs about what kind of form this should take. At the most affordable extreme, there's the mild hybrid approach. Uh, that's championed in this class by mild hybrid variants of Ford's Puma, which via a kinetic energy recovery system uh, can store energy that's harvested when you're cruising or braking, but that won't make a huge difference to your running cost returns. At the other end of the scale, of course, there are zero emission battery-only models uh, like the Peugeot E2008 or the Kona Electric, but with those you'll be afflicted by the scourge of range anxiety between lengthy battery charges. Interestingly, for the capture, Renault has chosen to ignore both those options and instead pretty much pioneer plug-in hybrid tech in this segment. That's something that we've only previously seen in a compact SUV in a version of Kia's Nero, which is a fractionally larger car. The electrified capture has a very different hybrid system from the one used in the Clio. Uh, in that Super Mini, the E-Tech setup is of the self-charging sort. It uses a small 1.2 kilowatt hour battery and it can't be plugged in for any significant degree of all electric range, uh, which are issues that also afflict two electrified self-charging hybrid small SUV rivals that potential capture buyers might be considering, the Toyota CHR and the Hyundai Kona hybrid. The Captur plug-in hybrid, in contrast, has a 9.8 kilowatt hour, 400 volt battery, and it's big enough to take plug-in tech, and it allows for a WLTP-rated all-electric driving range of around 30 miles, and that rises to around 40 on the urban cycle. 
Uh, there is a selectable pure drive mode setting that will keep you in full electric mode and an e-safe feature that will preserve battery charge until it might be needed, um, let's say for the urban driving that you might want to do at the end of a long trip. Charging time via a Type 2 Mode 3 cable is 3 hours or 4 hours 15 minutes from a domestic socket. Like all PHEVs, this one can offer three-figure combined cycle economy up to 188.3 mpg and a super low CO2 emissions figure, in this case 33 grams per kilometre, which in turn means a far lower BIK tax rating, 10%, than would be applied to a conventional petrol or diesel capture. Few potential capture buyers though will have the £30,000 budget required for e-tech plug-in ownership. So let's get back to looking at the mainstream part of the range. All the core power plants on offer are of course enhanced by the usual engineering efficiency measures. And aerodynamics have been carefully addressed with extra touches like drag reducing air deflectors fitted into each corner of the front bumper. Uh, a stop and start system is of course standard and that cuts out the engine when you don't need it, uh, for instance when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. As for the stuff that you can do to improve efficiency, well, provided you avoid entry level trim, your capture will come with a car info option on the centre dash screen that incorporates a driving eco section. Now this will score your driving out of 100 for acceleration and anticipation and it also shows a score history graph and the distance that you've travelled without consumption, i.e. when the start stop system has been active. Uh, there is also an eco tips section, although there aren't many tips in it and those that are there are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, you know, things like close the windows to improve air conditioning efficiency, uh, remove any fitted roof rack when you don't need it and regularly check tyre pressures, you know, that sort of thing. If you have a version of this Renault fitted with the multi-mode drive mode system, then you'll have a selectable eco drive setting available to you that restricts pulling power for more frugal returns. And if your capture has the seven inch digital instrument cluster, you'll find a selectable eco meter option in the top left part of it. Uh, you have to stay in the top green section for maximum frugality. Uh, there's also a little leaf graphic that gets bigger the more economically you drive. And you get a current MPG display as well. What else? Um, well, the five-year warranty looks good given that many rivals restrict you to three years cover. Now this package gives you unlimited mileage for the first two years and then you're limited to a total of 100,000 miles of driving or five years of motoring, whichever comes around first. Uh, you also get UK emergency breakdown recovery and three years worth of European cover as part of that warranty deal. Uh, finally, let's tell you that scheduled servicing is every 12 months or 18,000 miles, whichever comes soonest. Uh, and as usual, prepaid servicing plans are available. Uh, at the time of this test in winter 2019, uh, Renault was offering a three-year, 30,000-mile deal for £449 or a four-year, 40,000-mile package for £699 or £14 a month. Both figures significantly undercut what you'd have to pay for comparable fixed price servicing packages on that rival Ford Puma. Enough on efficiency issues, what about the other costs of running this car? Uh, depreciation for example. Well industry experts reckon this second generation capture will do slightly better than its predecessor. After three years and 36,000 miles, a volume capture TCE 100 play model is predicted to be worth 49% of its original value. That's very class competitive. It's interesting, by the way, to note that uh, super minis depreciate much faster than super mini based SUVs. A Clio TCE 100, for example, would be worth just 38% of its original value after the same period. What about insurance? Uh, well, all TCE 100 capture variants are rated at Group 8, which should make payments reasonable for younger drivers. Uh, for this four-cylinder TCE 130 model, it's Group 14 or 15, and for the perkier TCE 155 variant, it's Group 20 or 21. For the blue DCI 95 diesel derivative, it's Group 11 or 12, and for the blue DCI 115 EDC auto, it's Group 13 or 14. 
For the E-Tech petrol plug-in hybrid, it's Group 15E. If you want some overall competitor insurance perspective here, uh, we'll tell you that cover for arrival Skoda Kamiq varies between Groups 8 and 17, while insurance groups for a competing Ford Puma, they sit in the Group 11 to 15 bracket. Enough on efficiency issues, what about the other costs of running this car? Depreciation, for example. Well, industry experts reckon this second generation capture will do slightly better than its predecessor after three years and 36,000 miles. A volume capture TCE 100 Play model is predicted to be worth 49% of its original value, and that's very class competitive. It's interesting, by the way, to note that super minis depreciate much faster than super mini based SUVs. A Clio TCE 100, for example, will be worth just 38% of its original value after the same period. What about insurance? Well, all TCE 100 capture variants are rated at Group 8, which should make payments reasonable for younger drivers. Uh, for this four-cylinder TCE 130 model, it's Group 14 or 15, and for the Perkia TCE 155 variant, it's Group 20 or 21. For the blue DCI 95 diesel derivative, it's Group 11 or 12. And for the blue DCI 115 EDC Auto, it's Group 13 or 14. The E-Tech petrol plug-in hybrid, it's Group 15E. If you want some overall competitor insurance perspective here, we'll tell you that uh, cover for arrival Skoda Kamiq varies between Groups 8 and 17, while insurance group for a competing Ford Puma sit in the Group 11 to 15 bracket. Historically, in our market, the Capture has never sold quite as well as it does in continental Europe. But such is the step forward represented by this Mark II model that we think there's scope for that to change. It's passionate, practical and pretty stylish. And as a result, many target customers will find it quite an endearing thing. Of course, there's always a danger with this class of car that in its mix of SUV, MPV and family hatch, you end up with a confection lacking the core strengths inherent in any of those three genres. Broadly speaking, this is a trap that Renault has avoided here, provided your expectations in each of those areas aren't too great. Uh, this car doesn't have four-wheel drive, you can only just carry five people, and you won't want to drive it on its door handles, none of which will bother most buyers at the smaller end of the crossover segment one jot. Yes, there are some things we'd like to see Renault work on, some minor cabin quality issues, uh, the drivability of the EDC Auto gearbox, and perhaps a fractionally more comfort-orientated damping setup. But we can't see much of this deterring likely buyers. They'll love the buying personalization and the trendy touches like the clever infotainment system, the sliding rear bench, and the double height boot floor. Now true, this capture does face strong competition from a growing band of very talented rivals, but it's a model that you have to consider before buying any one of them. A uh, cleverer crossover. If you really want a car of this kind, then you'll really want to try this.